Not bad. We're at week five already, church. It's flying by. I hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have. And this week, we're going to be looking at relational health. And you might be saying to me, Ian, why do we need to look at that? Because we can't even spend time with each other right now. But it's actually more important now than ever before to find ways of connecting, even if we do have to spend our time with a two metres distance. And so Palumi is going to help us this morning to give us tools to find ways of connecting on a deeper level. And so we're going to hand over to Palumi right now for week five. Thanks, Ian. Well, like you said, my name is Palumi, and I have the privilege of being the Bracknell site pastor and um, looking at small groups and growth track courses across all of our sites. I'm married to the lovely Rachel, yes, with all due bias, the most beautiful girl on this planet. Happy Valentine's Day, baby. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it's just great privilege to be here with you today. Now, going back to that trick that Ian did, well, it is Valentine's Day, and we are continuing our series on relational well-being. I want to say this really clearly, clear the air right now, the fact that we didn't plan for the Relational Well-Being Day to fall on Valentine's Day, just so you're sure. And yeah, just bringing those two hearts together just makes it look really like I've been set up. But anyway, um, we don't want you to think that all our discussions today will be about romantic relationships. We want to focus on all kinds of relationships, whether it's a relationship in the family, whether you're talking about um, being on a team with friends, um, distributors and retailers, whether, whatever it might be. In fact, what I'd love for you to do right now is just probably pop in the chat where you feel relationally. For instance, just say, I'm Palumi and I'm a team player on a football team. So just put that in. Um, Whatever kind of relationship that you might find yourself in, one thing that I want to start off on is that Jesus says that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Yes, let's dwell on that a bit. Love your neighbor as yourself. You need to love yourself. Yes, when Jesus says that, he doesn't want you to be thinking that, why should I love myself? Why should I love other people? Let's look at what Paul said in Philippians when he said, in humility, consider others better than yourselves. He doesn't say have low self-esteem. When he says that, he wants you to walk in humility, standing at your full height in Christ Jesus to the fullness of all the um, potential that God has put you in, but having in mind that all the potential that God has given you is by his grace. That way, that's the true humility. Now, I want to put on my um, voice of, um, you know, just walking in series and say, previously, on the well-being series, and just go back to the very fact that at the very beginning, we were speaking about shalom, shalom, and that's the Hebrew term referring to our total well-being. And as we look at the whole series about, and look particularly at relationally being well, we want to ask ourselves the question, is a DIY approach to relationships or whatever we're trying to get on in life? Is that actually the best way to do it? Can, should we do it, go on, on, on it alone? So if you're just joining us on the Wellbeing series and you haven't had a look at who we've been studying, it's Elijah. And I just want to quickly go back and um, fill you in on some of the details. Now, King Ahab, the king of Israel at the time, he had gone and he'd married a princess from Sidon. And this lady, she had been very responsible, or she's been, you know, the one who's been influencing the whole of Israel in turning away from worshiping the one true God and worshiping a pagan God called Baal. And what he, Baal was particularly known for was he was supposed to be the God of rain, the God of storms, the God of seasons. So when um, Elijah... He faced Ahab and said, there wasn't going to be rain until I said so. That was a first direct affront to Baal, proving that, yes, this God is powerless. So when he did that, you can fast forward to three years plus later, and um, Elijah says to Ahab, I want us to have a contest. We'll go on to Mount Carmel, and the God who answers by sending down fire from heaven upon the sacrifice, let him 
be the one true God. So without saying too much, God won that contest hands down. Elijah went and he had all the prophets, the pagan prophets at the time, executed. And um, he went back up to Mount Carmel, prayed, and then it rained. So you could feel that Elijah was feeling probably very accomplished at this point in time. So I'd really encourage you to go and read 1 Kings 17 and 19 if you want to get all the juicy details. So let's pick up from there and um, look at the text that we've been looking at throughout this series. And that's in 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 9. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, bid ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah no doubt felt alone um, when he deliberately isolated himself. And we can see again in verses 3 and 4 of our text how clear that is. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. On at least two other instances, he expresses this. He does this on Mount Carmel when I said that he was having that contest. And we can see that in 1 Kings 18, 22. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the prophets of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. He says this again on Mount Sinai in 1 Kings 19, 14. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Now, there are three things that I believe that as we go, go along in this meeting, that if you can remember them, they will be really transformational to your relational well-being. The first one is this. Alone is not good. Many of us will ad identify with Elijah's sense of um, feeling alone. And here as we are in a pandemic and we're being isolated, having to spend so much time on our own and all sorts of things that we're experiencing. One thing we shouldn't do is push everyone away and feel that um, whenever we're going through anything that makes us feel down in the dumps, that we need to do this all by ourselves that we need to hunker down and just focus on it. Um, Elijah himself, you know, he, you can see from the text that he just kept on brandishing as bragging rights, the fact that he was all alone. He was the only one. And here I am not trying to point accusing fingers at Elijah because I feel and behave quite the same on so many occasions. I want to go into a shell, sometimes not answer my phone and things like that whenever I'm facing a deadline or having to make decisions. 
very recently, even when we were trying to um, get the resources, the books and the videos and everything for the well-being series, um, and we had been trying to purchase them during this new lockdown, I found it pretty difficult. I began to have headaches for days, wondering how I was going to get this and how to get this across to all our small group leaders and the members of their groups. But not until I began to have a conversation with members of the office team and say, please, I need help. They rose to the occasion and they helped me out, helped, looked at different ways that we could work this out. And then we got in touch with the Vera small group leaders and they were so instrumental in helping push this across. So doing it together always helps. Alone definitely isn't good. We can see God's thoughts um, about relationships and their benefits expressed right from the very beginning in Genesis as well. In Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. The first man needed a suitable helper. So I emphasize once again, alone is not good. If you need help, ask for help. Let's look at what Jesus did when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he, as well, had thoughts of death weighing on him. We can see that in Matthew 26, verses 36 to 38. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Here Jesus is saying, Keep watch with me, guys. I need you. If Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is all-powerful, who was there at the very beginning, creating things with God, if he could feel in a time of need that he needed people, then we too, we need people to get alongside us when we're going through things. Follow Jesus' example in Gethsemane. Not Elijah's example when he was in the wilderness. We need close people who we can be true with. Alone isn't good. Now here's the second thing that I'd love for you to remember. God loves you and he doesn't want to leave you alone. He will not leave you alone. Returning back to Elijah's story, um, let's see what happened when he um, finally heard the word of the Lord. I'd love for us to read 1 Kings 19, verses 15 to 18. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mehola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Here God reinforced to Elijah that he had a succession plan for him. And with his previous servant, with his previous servant, Elijah was able to say, hey, wait right here. I'm going into the wilderness and abandon him. But um, with, this new, um, pr with this new servant of his, this new friend who he would come to be, he couldn't do that. He had this pattern, you could say, of repeated, Elijah had this repeated pattern of saying that he wanted to go on his own and he wanted to leave Elisha behind. So let's see what happened in 2 Kings 2 verse 2 when he tried to do that. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. This time, in Elijah's true last moments on earth, this new friend of his, he couldn't give him the slip. Not at all. He was going to stick with him. 
This is evidenced by Elisha's repeated, prophet, um, his repeated protest three times. As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. Let's go back again to the time of Jesus in Gethsemane, just before he actually went there with his um, disciples. And he was saying this to them in John 16, 32. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Know this. Know this. No matter what, your heavenly Father loves you. He really, really loves you. Really. Unequivocally. Unconditionally. No matter what you've done, he loves you. He loves you because that's who he is. God is love. For him to stop loving you, he would stop being God. And he can't do that. And for this very reason, he gave his only son, Jesus, to die in our place. I would dare say this today on Valentine's Day, that he gave you the best Valentine gift ever. However, I must mention this, that in our relationships as well, we need to sometimes set barriers, set, actually not barriers, we need to set boundaries because we need to set that balance right. Jesus doesn't want us to be alone. But one thing we can see him doing is sometimes spending time alone in a different kind of way. I would say solitude, spending time alone with God. So sometimes we're going to need to set up boundaries so that we can devote quality time with the people that need to have that time with us. We need to pause. I'd like us now to take a moment and we'll watch a video that was put together for the well-being series, specifically for, the, for relational well-being. And we'll see um, one of the hosts on the series, Joanna, going to go and speak with Paul McGee, who is a well-known speaker and an author and popularly known as the sumo guy. So please watch your screens. Paul, it's so good to be in your kitchen. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm really pleased with this kitchen. I'd love to say I built it myself, but I didn't, but oh. it's, uh, it's all right. We are talking about relational well-being. So I want to know the relationship between you and your kitchen. How strong is it? How strong is the bond? Um, is my wife going to see this filming? I, I mean, there's a chance that she <laughs> might. <laughs> I love this kitchen and I love eating in this kitchen and enjoying all the delicious meals my wife makes in this kitchen. <laughs> so I have a very strong emotional relational strong, bond strong to it. Bond. Now, so tell me, now you've been thinking a lot about um, relational well-being and I, I just want to know how important is it to our overall well-being? Well, it's interesting. You saw Milo, my cat, earlier, my lovely cat. And what's really interesting about Milo is when he was born as this little kitten, he latches onto his mum for a little bit of milk. And before you know it, weeks later, he's, he's independent and he's away from his mum. Um, and creatures can be a little bit like that. But when you think about when, when we're born, um, we're born completely helpless. We are dependent on others for our survival. But then I think from an emotional point of view, you could almost argue we need people to help us survive, particularly when we're very young and vulnerable, but we need relationships to thrive in terms of our uh, emotional well-being. It's just inbuilt into our very DNA that yeah. we need people. I have to use the phrase humans need humans. Yeah. So not all relationships are the same. There's different kind of levels of relationship. Talk to us about what they look like and how to navigate those. I think it's a really good question because we, we do have different kinds of relationships and you've got those, those very intimate, what you might call your inner circle, 
One of the things that I think can easily happen is we, we take for granted that these relationships that we have will automatically be good. Mm -hmm. And I often use this phrase, no investment, no return. Yeah. And, and sometimes what happens is you're so busy looking after the peripheral relationships, those more social connections, mm -hmm. sometimes the most, those acquaintances, yeah. that sometimes then you neglect the real key relationships. And I, I, I spend a lot of time speaking at events. And, and one of the things that I've realized in my marriage you know, my intimate relationship with my wife and with my two children, is that at times I thought my clients got the best of me, but my family got the dregs of me. And so, hang on a minute, you're investing in certain relationships, which is good, but at what cost, at what price? And it's important to keep on never taking those intimate, close relationships for granted. You know, there's that phrase, the grass is always greener, where it's watered. Yeah. And therefore, I think there needs to be, I mean, I, I talk about, I call it a life blend model. And, I, and, I, and part of that blend is about your work, it's about your, your contribution, your giving, about your recreation, but it's also about your relationships. Mm -hmm. And just being mindful, every week I will reflect on those four quadrants. Mm -hmm. And the one that often can get overlooked if I'm not careful is about those relationships because we're so caught up in the pace of life and the busyness of life and the, the challenges that are placed on us. And yet I would say this, our biggest source of joy, as well as our biggest source of pain, comes from our relationships, it really does. Our biggest source of pain and joy sometimes comes from our relations, our relationships. So the third thing I'd love for you to remember is this. God wants you to forgive and experience restoration. When issues arise that lead to us falling out with people in our close circles come up, it can often lead to a root of bitterness that only harms not just us, but the people around us. And God doesn't want us to continue dwelling in a place where we continue to experience this hurt and hurt those around us. You know, when we leave unforgiveness in our hearts, it can be like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. And that's not the way that we should go. We, in many cases, can't hold people responsible for the way they act or they react. But one thing we can do is we can initiate forgiveness. We can initiate the way to do right. Initiating forgiveness and reconciliation can bring about such freedom to us, freedom that Jesus freely gives, that he wants us to embrace. Sometimes as well, we get so deeply hurt when um, we see injustices done to other people. And one thing that I often tell people is that we shouldn't take sides when things like that happen. Because sometimes the parties who are directly affected they can go away and they can reconcile in private. And we can be left holding the bag years later, holding grudges, letting this bitterness, you know, just keep on digging away at us. So let's learn to hold some of these things loosely and forgive. It will bring us so much healing. I want us to take a look at Romans 12 verse 18. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This implies that relational reconciliation isn't always possible. And especially in cases where there are people that we are involved with and they don't want to be reconciled. In some other cases, it's not even advised, especially when we have a perpetrator of abuse who is totally unrepentant. I want to acknowledge that the journey to forgiveness is something that can be really painful and may take a, quite a journey. And it probably can't be addressed very well in a Sunday morning preach. I want to recommend to you one of our growth track courses, um, Freedom in Christ, which you can be a part of in a small group next term, where the issue of forgiveness is dealt with um, more in depth and which can really, really bring about some healing. I pray that wherever you are on this journey to forgiveness, that you will experience in full the freedom that Jesus gives. 
Now looking back to Elijah's experience, we see his relationship with God and his relationship with man. They were restored and enriched. He seems to have also built a relationship with Elisha up to the point where Elisha could now be seen as his friend. And Elijah, we never hear on record him saying once again, I'm all alone. I'm the only one left. So once again, here are the three things that I'd love for us to remember. Number one, alone is not good. Two, God loves you and will not leave you alone. And three, God wants you to forgive and experience restoration. I invite you to consider what your next steps will be on your journey to relational well-being. For some, it will be acknowledging that alone is not good. As we journey through life, we need to consolidate our existing relationships and sometimes build new ones that will be enriching. We may even need to sever um, relationships that are not really helpful to us, that are draining and destructive. For some, we might need to become like Elisha, who will be that unwavering solid rock of a friend to the people around us. For some, it will be being a part of a small group where you can um, give to the support system or experience the support that is there. And yet for some, it will be forgiving someone who has hurt you deeply, thereby releasing yourself to all that God wants you to have and all the joy that there is. You may ask, why should I forgive? We forgive because we were forgiven. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. God loved us so much, so much that he sent his son to die in our place. He wanted us forgiven. Jesus took the place that we should have taken in dying so that we could live his life. On the third day, he rose up from the dead and now he lives at the right-hand side of our Father in heaven. Yes, he's inviting us to live his life, his eternal life. And perhaps today you might consider yourself not a part of his family, but you'd love to be a part of his family. In a moment, we're going to put up a prayer on the screen, which you can pray along so that you can enjoy his love and enjoy his forgiveness. You'll find that prayer as well on the back of um, your 50-day guide. And as it comes up on the screen, let's pray along together. Lord Jesus, I admit my need of you and invite you to come and forgive me. I believe that you died and rose again so that I could receive new joy, purpose, hope, and well-being. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I commit to follow you and your ways all the days of my life. Amen. Now, if you've just prayed that prayer, I'm excited and I'm sure a host of us are excited. The Bible even tells us that there's a party in heaven celebrating you for making that decision.